listen to this, or they don't really have to. <laughs> but I am going to do this real quick. Um, what I'd like to do both during this part of the presentation, let's see what I do. This and during uh, the transducer part is just open for questions. Just speak up. We can have a dialogue instead of speech if that if that works. If don't ask questions, then it'll be a speech, I guess. <laughs> inviting me here. I'm very excited. I've had an awesome time with the tours and everything today. And uh, uh, you guys are about, I don't know, the 15th maybe. I was counting the other day. I remember a section that I had the privilege to visit this year. So I'm very excited that uh, I'm getting to do this. I'm very happy. Um, Are you the best one you've been to so far? <laughs> I don't know. No. The best in Salt Lake. Huh? <laughs> I have to admit that Charlotte put on a shrimp boil that way. So, uh, you know. <laughs> and no snow, probably. And no, it was September and it was 75 and there was shrimp boil in. So, you know, but the snow made you a definite almost tie. I do oh, like get snow. some shrimp for, for our next one. That's right. Anyway, uh, membership is actually uh, pretty amazing that it's it's been on kind of a steady growth trend. I mean, obviously not straight up. There's ups and downs, but a steady growth trend, uh, both individual and corporate memberships, which is a very nice and it's not necessarily being seen in every society, but we're doing pretty well. That's as many people as uh, we've had in a long time. So, And then that total number of sections, 84, 70 domestically, 14 internationally. Um, now if you ask me, total number of active sections, and then we get down into what we, shall we define as an active section as far as um, the headquarters defines active section as having uh, submitted officers and budgets. So you've done that for the year, you've submitted officers and budgets. Hopefully you're also meeting, but that would be considered. That's closer to 30 of the uh, 84 sections. It's tough. It's really tough right now to, to uh, get people to meetings, to get people to have time to organize work all working really long hours, so we all have families. It's, uh, back home, it's like, you can't have anything on Wednesday, it's either softball or church, you know? Anything but softball and church, and you're just totally out of luck. So, you know, you have to work around all these things with family. But yeah, that's pretty good membership numbers. Uh, there's a new video. I think it's excellent. Um, it's kind of amusing. I've got it on here, so if anyone's interested, we can play it. It's only. 10 to 12 minutes long. It's pretty good. It's downloadable off the uh, homepage of the ASMT website. Depending on the size you get, uh, they have a 40 meg and a 100 meg version, so you can decide which one you want. Uh, it's it's excellent. They originally, I think, were making it for <coughs> high school, but you notice it says age is 14 to 16. It's young high school. But even so, that's not a bad thing because as we were discussing earlier, um, once you get too far into high school, the kids are already thinking of what they have in mind for what they want to do next. You want to catch them early on. Start talking to them in middle school at 14 years old. But this is a very good video. And it was about time to, because I think the other one was at least 14 years old. Some of us didn't look the same in that video. <laughs> okay. So here are some upcoming ASMT conferences. We were just uh, talking briefly about the spring conference, March 16th through 20th in St. Louis. And the automotive industry advancements uh, topical is uh, in May. IC Pit, which is always a very nice conference down in Houston in June. I know, I hope you're trying to. <laughs> and, uh, Digital Imaging is coming up, and then next October is the uh, annual fall conference, and that's in uh, Columbus, Ohio, which, you know, that's a pretty good town. Yeah. And obviously, if you go to the website, you can get all the information, you know, on all of these things. You can register, you can 
do whatever you need to do. Uh, the website is uh, a very nice place to go. It's not an attractive place to go. Don't tell me that I said that. <laughs> it's not the most updated thing in the world. That's going to hopefully begin to be worked on. But it's very nice, very utilitarian. It has the information that you need on it. So you can go there for general information. You can go into the members only area. Uh, ask the president feedback form. The nice thing about ask the president is you email it in. Um, everyone at, at headquarters and me gets it. You know, you get 12 people trying to come up with a good answer for you. So you know, you don't. Have, you aren't just asking me. You're asking experts. So there you go. Uh, the online uh, certificate holder registry. Uh, that the uh, level threes are online. It makes it easier to update. It's always constantly uh, correct. As you know, we used to put it in the yearbook in February, and that was the only place it was. Well, you know this doesn't stay static for a year, so this is very nice because it can be live. Updated monthly. Uh, here's some upcoming uh, exams. March 14th and 15th, that's to coincide with the uh, spring conference. And then, uh, then Columbus has some going on between and then at the fall conference. So those are some level three exam dates. International, one coming up in April. Okay, these publications have recently been released. And uh, you can uh, obviously call the headquarters or go online and uh, get the if you need any of these publications. I usually have a list of what's in the pipeline, but I, I don't at the moment. There's a lot going on and probably will get updated a little better here at the spring conference. Section news, I don't know, do you guys send uh, your news, your information about your meetings into the headquarters to go into the section news? We haven't as so of yet. Okay, well it's kind of nice because it used to be you'd send it in, Depending on what part of the printing cycle you might get your, your article in, in in two months or three months. But now, pretty much as soon as it goes in, it, it's put up on the website. And so that's nice. The web is, is pretty swell that way. Now, RNDE is doing great. Um, the volume 19 next issue is uh, mailing in October. Do we have any researchers here that take the r and I, I, it, it, I can't read it most of the time. I mean, um, it's definitely a research magazine and it has interesting topics that I, I'm not a researcher, I can't follow, but uh, it, they're very excited. The research group uh, in, in the a and is very excited about that that to magazine. Um, I do like the NDT technician really well. Um, our current secretary treasurer, Rick Morgan, out of the LA section, is the driving force behind us having this NDT technician newsletter at all. He pushed and pushed and, until that came through. And uh, I really like that. And you guys, I don't know, we were talking earlier also about schools, career days, high schools, et cetera. You can get copies of these at any, any amount to hand out places to arrange subscriptions to, and it's, it's really nice. Obviously, we have lots of things to sell. Oh, I forgot this was on here. This is, uh, when I was over at, at the uh, North Atlantic section, they were really curious about this, and, and you know, I'm not in certification management, so, I can't really go through the whole um, chart of what gets you points and what, but these two points right here are very important. If one or more of your current methods expires before May of this year, you renew using the six-point system, okay? If all of your current methods expire after April, all of them, then you go over the 25-point renewal program. And that's all that's on the on the website, but I thought these two, these dates here would be pretty important. So okay. 
that's helpful. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Yeah, question, Jocelyn. Uh, I see that uh, some of the training centers are, are giving the S and T exams, and I've noticed that uh, you can now take it on the computer to the to like kill you. You can go to one of their facilities and the uh, an A S and T level three exam on the computer. How has that been working out? Slow, but but <coughs> it's getting there. The, um, the authorized exam centers have the Citrix space, and uh, uh, people like being able to do it that way. But uh, I think most people still come in to um, these these central locations. Uh, the, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head of how many people will go to uh, a distant uh, testing center, but uh, most people. Uh, from my understanding and from talking to folks, still go into the conference or, or go to one of the centralized places and do it. So I don't know if we could get everything on that Citrix. That would be pretty nice. Wouldn't have to go anywhere. Uh, I've heard that uh, if you do take your exams online, where uh, you get an immediate result. Is that correct? I have heard that as well, and that is my understanding. I can't guarantee that to you. Yeah, you do. So, okay, so I'm like, I'm like back in 97 when I took mine, the, well, the first time. I've only reviewed my points since then. I'm not taking those again. Um, you're, I'm at work, and my daughter, my daughter calls, and she goes, you have a... Uh, envelope here. I said, what's it from? And she's like, and then she's like, what should I do? I said, I have put it there. No, open it. No, put it down. <laughs> no. <laughs> so my daughter, who, let's see, that was, she was uh, about 14 at the time. And she's, she finally, I finally got her to read it to me over the phone because I couldn't take it any longer. Yeah, the, the computer thing will be much nicer. So, you know, the pain will come much quicker. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I think actually waiting in agony for that pain or not is a, is probably almost the worst. The waiting is the worst thing. Okay. Once again, if you have any questions or comments as we go along. Um, Ask, say, whatever. Sigma Transducers Incorporated has been in business since uh, 1988. As a matter of fact, our anniversary is next month. And uh, so we will be 21 years old next month. Uh, we have always manufactured everything considered standard to the industry. I mean, you can call me up, say you need a quarter five or a 45 degree shoe or whatever you want. I, I can do that for you. But our niche really has been special applications. So I get almost as many phone calls for that quarter inch shoe as I do. I get, I have a problem. May I send you a drawing? Or may I send you a sample piece? And so we get that both ways. And so what I thought I'd do tonight is just kind of go through some of the thought processes we go through, what I need to know from you, for example, perhaps if, if you need something specially designed for you. Okay, and this is this just stating the obvious. Ultrasound's been around a really long time. Changes in materials and computers and software have made major differences. And uh, using all those combinations, there's really a lot we can do. sizes there. Oh, thank you. Um, that the one with the six inch scale beside it is a, uh, uh, a transducer <coughs> that's being used in the lumber industry and through transmission. So it has a mate. 
uh, very low frequency, um, and uh, they're set uh, across from each other, and lumber is shot through. And since it's on bearings, and these are rolling probes, then as the lumber shoots through, the wheel uh, turns, and we look for um, velocity changes in the material to determine how dry the lumber is. So that, that's just an interesting application for that. The other ones you see here are our standard uh, transducers for non-destructive testing. Uh, this, the set of three there is a three inch and a one inch diameter. Um, the uh, one inch diameter that's pictured there is for thickness. As you can see, uh, it, it's pretty small. When you say an inch diameter, you don't think about it, but there's Larry's thumbs and finger just holding the edges of that thing. And um, so the uh, rolling probe is just a fancy housing. Any transducer can go in it. Angle beam, dual focus, L wave, sure wave, thickness mode. Uh, so, oh, and there's another one. Goodness, who knows? Is there like a, excuse me, but is there like a mirror in there, a reflector? No, it's, um, the, uh, let's take, for example, the one in the guy's hands mm -hmm. up there, okay? So you're seeing a cork barrier and two, two uh, elements. You can see the two chips in there. We do all of our uh, rolling probes in um, pitch catch because of the layers. So you have a transducer built up into, it's just like on your car. So the tra it's got an axle and a wheel and a tire. So the transducer is built up into the axle for the step. And so that's what he's grabbing there. And then there's bearings and seals at the ends. And between what you see there is basically the shoe. The brown you see is the shoe. There's a approximately three mil couplet layer between the elements and that, that wheel that goes around. Then what goes on the outside of that then is the, the tire that can be used for dry coupling. So it's just a transducer. It's just a, kind of in a fancy package. The one in the bottom, let's see, right hand corner there, uh, those are have been radius to sit on catenary wire, which is the big uh, copper wire that's for electrical power. And uh, that was for a research project. I don't know exactly whatever good they got out of it, but I don't know if you've heard of Southwest Research uh, down in Texas. They do a lot of interesting projects, and, and uh, so they were testing catenary wire. And so that was shaped to sit. And this is just an assortment of interesting ID4 uh, wheel probes, multi transducer sleds. See, I got this new toy. <laughs> Thank you. So this one, there's there's about six transducers in that, so that they can go in an area and look all kinds of directions. And uh, they just, depending on the software that they've got set up, they look one at a time, or they run everything and they sort it out later. So just a number of different, this goes inside. That's a, a J-weld pr weld probe. It's inside of a, a J-weld area in the nuclear plant. And those are angle beam immersions. So see the, the lens transducers are there, and they're set at an angle to give them the angle that they need after going through the water. Into the weld. I do pull up the wrong one. Hello. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I was doing. Okay. Anyway, well, this is more entertaining. So, this is a uh, that's a dual focus zero there. This guy actually, uh, I, I am glad he's there. He is. Uh, he has three transducers in him. He has two 70 degree angle beam and an ADL creeper built in a tandem. It's got a, about a, just about a 0.24 inch diameter that housing is. Uh, not as small as the 0.03s we were talking about earlier. I have one of the guys building up two transducers with 30,000 elements, and he's not very happy with me at the moment. 
Because he did the 40s and thought that was going to be good enough, but the customer said, smaller, smaller. So, but, uh, so, like I said, the, okay. <coughs> Okay, so what determines a design of an ultrasonic transducer? All right, the flaw. The size, shape, orientation, reflection coefficient. What flaw are you looking for? You know, that's how you pick what transducer you're going to use, even when you just have a toolbox and you're, looking, you're not designing them. The part, the type of material, shape, complexity, the attenuation of the material, and that just goes with type. Uh, the specification of the flaw. So besides the flaw, shape, and size, et cetera, what's your critical flaw size? What kind of resolution requirements do you have? Um, are you trying to do some detection, just detection? You're going to go along and mark places where you can check later. You're going to go through and detect its size and uh, place. So and a lot of times, the ultrasonic equipment you're using will make a big difference. Okay, so I just put this one up here, various different flaws, hard to know when sees those giant ones, but I thought this was interesting. We had a customer send us this, uh, it's basically a Cal standard, but they were doing, uh, they needed to check this, this weld area from the ID when they were in the plant, and there's great difficulty with ovality and uh, contraction, different different uh, diameters in there. So we took a cast. You can see how it changed the diameter inside of there. So we took a cast so we could play with ball pointers and stuff so that we could make sure that we went through there. Part complexity. Okay. So the shape complexity of the part. You may be doing ID tests. OD tests, not everything's flat. Uh, in nozzles, the uh, in nozzles you may need to work with a compound radius. You go from an ID and then go around the edge of the nozzle, which is what you see here is uh, this direction, it's up inside, and then this direction, I've got two. You see the compound radius there? So that transducer was designed so that it could it could kind of compromise and, and go over the two different radiuses. So we need to know what your part looks like. I usually ask for drawings, ask for all the information. Oops. What did I do? Okay, well, the material, velocity of the material, between material, uh, velocity differences are major. So I know that as a general rule, if you pick up a, a shoe for an angle beam test, it's probably a sheer weight for carbon steel. It depends on what shop you're in. But if you pick up an angle beam shoe for carbon steel and use it on an austenitic material in a canal or a stainless or something, you, your angle's going, your, your actual refracted angle's going to be in the range of two, degree, two degrees different than it was in the carbon steel. So we will a lot of times, uh, people will ask us to make shoes and different things for specific materials. If you look up here, and I'm talking inches, I hope that's okay. I get people all the time like, well, no, I'm like, um, and so here's the lo longitudinal velocities and the shear velocities. If you look at brass, the longitudinal velocity of the material in brass is 0.17 inches per microsecond, whereas in canal is 0.22 inches per microsecond, and then the carbon steel is 0.23, and I, we actually take that out. I use 231. But, so then and you see in the shear, once again, you have quite a bit of difference. And believe it or not, an incident angle built for this, even though you've only got that much different, will make a refracted angle difference in the other material of about two degrees. So we need to know that. 
you can just tell us what you've measured or what you're using, or you can send us a part and we'll measure that velocity for you. <coughs> Okay, and the specification, so your critical flaw size, lateral and temporal resolution requirements, detection, <coughs> sizing, okay. All right, so, so your critical flaw size then is going to determine what kind of frequency you want your transducer to be and what kind of bandwidth that you want it to be. So I've got an example here of some bandwidths. They're all the same frequency, but using different bandwidths. <clears throat> so go through here, 100% down to 10%. A standard transducer, and that's a little ugly, but a you know, standard kind of middle of the road transducer you'll see two to two and a half cycles, you know, your 50% range. Um, but if you have a really tight resolution requirement or a very critical flaw size, then you're going to want to to have a very high bandwidth so that you have as few cycles as possible. <coughs> um, you know, I'm sorry. I'm not good at this thing. Well, this place has had a, a really nice remote. I'm going to have to get one. I just plugged it through a USB and I just did here. And it even went backwards without me thinking about it. So we talked about the, uh, the resolution, the tiny space between flaws. Okay? So you remember the pictures that you saw on the previous slide with all the different numbers of... of, uh, of uh, Oh, the, well, the band with the cycles. <laughs> it's just like, thank you. <laughs> uh, with all the different cycles, well, obviously, you can get away with maybe an extra half cycle or cycle when you're looking at this kind of separation. But as you go down and you see that the flaws are going to be closer together, you can see why having a number of cycles is going to mask your flaws. So resolution, I'll need to know that from you. I, if you call me and you ask me to help you with something, I'm going to need to know a lot of things because if it's for a special application, it has to be exactly right. Otherwise, you would have just reached in your toolbox and found the closest thing. You wouldn't be worrying about this. Okay, one thing we do at Sigma, and that's nothing. It's just a noble. It's not a sound beam, actual sound beam path or anything. But, um, is if I'm talking to you and you're telling me that you're going through and you're going to go do detection and maybe come back later, right, and verify some sizes or double check things, then I will probably want to design and recommend to you a beam pattern at the probable flaw place that's rather like this paintbrush kind of shape. It's a detection, it sweeps. You've got kind of a sweep going through. And I would consider this uh, the sh a beam shape that I would I would pick element size and shapes for to reach this at your flaw place for detection. I would also use this at about the three near fields. So you get it. So you've got pretty good spread, but you haven't gone all the way out in your spread, and you've got a lot of good. That, uh, still got a strong amount of energy there. So that's what I would do if you simply wanted to go through and do some detection. 